Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths, I work in Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This kicks off a new series of videos that I'm making, Linux on Power for AIX people. This is part one, we'll look at configurations to make life easier. Now I'm the proud owner of a blog called the Air Expert, and you can see the URL there, tinyurl slash airexpert. And there's an entry in there called Linux on Power Advantage, and it depends on where you're coming from. And that all boils down to the following facts, after many hundreds of words. I classified the users that are going to use uh, Linux on Power into three sort of groups. There's the current AX on Power users. These are the people that I tend to know because I've been working with them for many years. There's the AX or dead team, um, and they may be missing a trick. Linux can do some things very nicely which are a bit tricky on AX. Then there's the AX are hard guys. Um, they can do a bit of Linux on the side too, and they could do that on Power, so why not? And I guess these are the first guys that might uh, watch this movie. Then we have the big iron guys, these are our big powerful machines, 64 and way above up to 256 cores. They have a thing called IFL, Integrated Facility for Linux, which allows them to take uh, resources on the machine that aren't currently switched on at a very low price to gain access to Linux on power. Then there's the Linux guys coming from the uh, homeland of uh, Linux on the x86 machines. They might like the idea of power scale up, 200 way machines in a single uh, virtual machine. They might want a bit of that. Maybe their uh, company's growing so rapidly they need some really big databases. Also, there's some specific features, perhaps, of the uh, Power 8 machines, uh, particularly things like uh, very, very fast memory. There's also people wanting an, an easier way of life on a bigger box. There's no doubt about it that if you have uh, one or a few large boxes instead of a hundred little ones, um, you can take those massive spikes in demand uh, very much easier because you've got a lot of resources that you can throw at a single virtual machine that actually needs the oomph to get the work done. Then there's the Linux or Die team. Perhaps they're willing to try a bit of power if it's exactly like their... Uh, x86 machines, and this is the idea of the, the Power KVM that's uh, recently been launched in 2014. So once they've uh, plugged the box in, they can't really tell whether it's an x86 or a power box, and then they get some of the advantages of power. There's also a group of people which I call cloud ranchers. Uh, these are the guys that are producing large clusters of machines, and they, they've got to think big. And their, their key things are uh, cost. They're particularly interested in, in the CPU uh, core strength. How much work can they get done on a single thread, or how many uh, logical partitions, virtual machines, they could run on a single core. Then they're looking at the cost. Also, some of those advanced functions uh, with Power 8. Cost automation um, they're putting in you know 50 to 100 machines a week they've really got to get things automated or they'll have to employ thousands of employees to run around doing things and cost i keep saying cost in here because if you are introducing machines by by the thousand if you can save a few bucks um, then you actually save mega bucks uh, at the end of the day so they're very very focused on reduced cost and automation of the computer room and it does set some expectations here. I'm going to assume that you have a computer room, you've got a few machines. Uh, many machines are running AIX, so you know how to operate a HMC or an IBM. Um, you know AIX reasonably well, installing it, general admin, that sort of stuff, the Unix side of the, the world. Then you've used something called VNC, Virtual Network Computing. And that probably you've experimented a little bit with Linux on a PC or a laptop, so you know some of the basics there. I'm not really going to cover if this is the first ever PowerBox you've ever seen, or this is a first time Linux user. We're not going to tell you to have to use VI or something. And we're going to assume that you're, you're happy with a VNC viewer on your workstation, whatever that happens to be. So here's my criteria for a good project. Probably only cover the first six uh, in this video. The virtual machine is not going to be treated as a throwaway laptop trial. It's going to be a server. We're going to set it up properly. We'll have disk protection so that if the, disks, the disk subsystem fails, then we can carry on running. We're going to have a redundant paths to our disks and network. We're going to have uh, DR ready, so we've got some sort of data protection, mirrors ready, those sort of things. Uh, live partition mobility are ready, and we're going to uh, talk about the install media or mechanism. Later on, then, we'll look at actually installing, getting it on the network, VNC, so we have uh, pretty X-Windows access to everything um, on the graphical user interface. 
we're going to get make sure the OS is updated above what was on the uh, original media because that can be months old. Uh, time and date, NFS, I want to do that so that I can pull in packages from my AIX repository. And then I want to uh, create users so we're ready to go. In another one of my AXPERT blogs, we had a look at the various ways of hosting an operating system, and there are five ways to do that. We'll cut to the chase. Here we go. We can run a native one operating system on the whole machine headless. So we have an RS232 line to the machine to give ourselves a console. We could have graphics actually in the machine. In the smaller machines, we can still do that. We have the integrated virtualization manager, um, which is like a cut down HMC running in the VO server that owns the machine or we can use the hardware management module the HMC. The new one in town of course is Power KVM. we're not going to look at that in a lot of details here because we're talking about the AX guys and they don't yet have any Power KVM machines as they're just out and they won't run AX. So the top two up in here pretty like you're running it as a simple PC but we're dedicating the whole machine to one OS, and that's not the way we do that with power, because that's a, a great waste of the resources. No virtualization, so we throw out one of the core strengths of our power machines. We have to uh, connect this up to a uh, an RS-232 cable, um, and I've got another blog that says this is really, really difficult. Getting the cables right, uh, your workstations probably haven't got serial ports, so you need a USB conversion cable to get that right and then when you get onto your workstation you may not actually have the software to run a dumb console so you have to fix all those sorts of things just to get something that we used to have every day working in a computer room uh, just 10 years ago. Then it's all single user and you have to sit there with a box until it's um, on the, the network. You have no mechanism for doing cold starts of uh, your machine. And to be honest, the graphic cards are fairly rare. They're not very high resolution. They're a little bit embarrassing, to be honest. And it doesn't scale. If you've got to do this 200 times, you've got to be there for 100 days. And we looked uh, around uh, with my people and we sort of discussed and bounced some num uh, numbers around about who's using what in the computer room. And we think it's about 95% of the power machines are using the hardware management console. Uh, power KVM has just arrived as we said. No, it's only on Power 8, only the Linux model machines if it's bought with um, KVM and of course we can't run AIX or IBM I. So I recommend you use what you're already using for AIX, a HMC, Power VM and your VAO servers. Okay, let's talk disks. I've got six different ways of connecting up some disk space to our virtual machine running Linux on Power. In my opinion, if these are all you've got, internal disks or, or disconnected to your physical adapters and you have to put that into your virtual machine, then bad luck. Most internal disks are to be supported with uh, AX6, certainly from Power 6 um, onwards, or on Power 8 now, of course. Uh, if you have to go for physical adapters, uh, the simpler RAID cards and physical adapters should work, but you really do need to check that first, that we have device drivers to match those. The simpler one should be okay. Any really high function, really fast one may may not have the adapter device drivers available. This is totally though cutting across the, the virtualization and cloud um, trends. Basically, physical I.O. is dead. It's both costly and it's harder to work with takes you time and effort and money. Now if you've got virtual disk because you've got virtual I.O. servers, this is bread and butter for your AX guys. In my humble opinion, this is very good. In this case, when we've got Linux running in our virtual machine, it will see a virtual SCSI adapter. This is a very simple device driver. It's software only. It can't go wrong. It's error free. It doesn't have to deal with the complexities of real disks and real uh, cables failing at the back end and have to restart and retry communications to get a horrible physical device working. And if you're using virtual disks, of course, then you're ready for live partition mobility. This is uh, really worth having. At the end here, we have virtual disks via the virtualized server, but that they are sitting on top of a shared storage pool 4. In this case, Linux again sees a virtual SCSI, can't go wrong, hide the complexity of the VO server that we already know how to deal with as AIX people. The shared storage pool actually does some extra things for us. First of all, we can set up mirroring across our shared storage pool, so we can mirror across two different subsystems. And that means if we have an entire disk subsystem failure, we can carry on running. That's a very nice feature to have. And again, Linux doesn't have to know about that. We can deal with that in 
shared storage pool technology inside the virtual O server that we already know how to do. It also means that we're actually going to do the mirroring in the shared storage pool so the Linux doesn't have to see the two disks and do the two writes and have some strategy for a recovering from a disk failure, particularly the boot failure. This is all hidden from uh, the Linux end of things. Also in the virtual I.O. server, we can do thin provisioning regardless of what's at the back end, and we can do disk snapshots. This is a very nice way of taking a set of disks before you try experiments, and in this case maybe experiments trying to load uh, applications. And if they, uh, they, you mess it all up, well you can stop the virtual machine, rewind, the, roll back the snapshot in about three or four seconds and give it another go. Really nice asset to have when you're trying things for the first time with Linux on power. Okay, on to networks. Uh, physical adapter, we could do that via the VO server. Dual VO server, remember we wanted multiple parts to this, so there's, there's two options for that. Is a network backup, so we present over the two virtual IO servers two different network connections, and the operating system in the virtual machine has to do with those two and um, recover if one fails. Or we can use the C failover, so in that case the VO server will cater the fact that um, a network has failed and the operating system in the virtual machine doesn't need to know. So obviously that last one is the better one. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, gives us the reliability with less manpower. That goes for AIX and Linux. And we keep Linux unaware of the fact there's two networks and we don't have to set it up, which is good. If we're new to Linux, then we don't have to learn how to do that and still get the reliability features. So here's my keep it simple stupid uh, layout of what we're uh, going to recommend. We have our Linux in the middle here, two virtual I.O. servers using virtual SCSI, nice and simple. We're going to use the VO servers using a shared storage pool with the shared storage pool um, failure groups. We have two mirrored copies of the data in two different disk subsystems at the bottom. Uh, that will be mirrored for us at the VO server so that Linux doesn't uh, aware of that. And we're going to have live partition mobility already set up by default. On the network side then, we're going to have the two virtual I.O. servers, and they're actually going to present one uh, virtual network to the virtual machine with C failure over working between the two V.O. servers. Now, in actual fact, those two sets of V.O. servers will be the same V.O. servers as broke it out in this diagram to make it simple to see it. A quick word on the consoles. If you use the HMC and open the console, you'll be using something called VTerm. Um, here it is. It's pretty ghastly. I'm sorry, IBM. It's just a lot to spec. It doesn't understand the box characters and cursors, so it outputs some blobs. Over here we have, uh, this is uh, Suzy Linux running Yast. Works very well on a uh, regular X Windows or Putty session in VTerm. It's a complete wreck. Bits of things hanging about. It's actually a bit of a survival course. This is just not the way to install a server and know what you got. We also have a problem if you do a copy. Um, it doesn't understand the idea of blank lines, so if you have 20 blank lines that you want to copy, you have to do the whole screen, and you'll probably get 1,600 spaces. Um, complete nonsense. There is a better way. And here it is. You log on to your HMC. I use PuTTY over SSH, but any 2 millimeters should be much better. Once you've uh, logged in with your, your regular HMC user and password, then you run the VT menu command. This presents your list of machines, and you select your machine. Then your list of virtual machines, and you select that. You uh, do should uh, log out of your console once you've finished, so that it won't be left hanging. And then you use the tilde dot character to actually stop the uh, VT menu program. It lets you exit. You may have to use tilde dot twice to get its attention. Now the next big question is, well, Linux, well, there's lots of versions and distros, and uh, which one should we try with Linux and Power? It's a problem, if you like, with Linux. There's so many of them to try, so I'm going to make a few comments about them. Uh, this is where I generate all sorts of uh, hate mail and just heated discussions, because everybody's got an opinion and a favourite, but I'll, I'll try and be as fair as I can. This you know, is a point in time. I'm making this video July 2014, and things will change. So, um, the first up, I have uh, Suzy, the uh, Linux Enterprise Server here, 11.3, um, been out um, nine months or something like that, and they're currently um, getting ready to launch um, 
version 12. It's in uh, beta testing. It's not a public beta, so you'd have to ask uh, the, the Suzy Novell team about if you want to join that and try it out. Um, on the Red Hat side, we've had 6.5 around for uh, quite a while, and um, last month the Enterprise Linux 7 uh, was released, so that's uh, quite up to date. That was actually a public beta, so you could get hold of uh, you know weekly builds and things if you wanted to. Um, there's, there's a couple of other ones. Those are the Enterprise Linuxes. They're the ones that IBM is working um, with the uh, vendor for a long time. You can buy the support from us or from the uh, the operating system vendor, Suzy or Red Hat. Um, on the uh, free Linux uh, side, we have uh, Debian 7.4. Uh, again, that came out in the last month or so. Uh, the Debian guy is pretty cool. To be honest, the, the installer is probably the slickest in, in Debian. I mean, they really do impress uh, me in the, the technology and uh, getting things working just right. We also have uh, Fedora 20. Fedora is the uh, sort of forerunner to, to Red Hat. That's always got the very latest versions of all the new software, open source software uh, in there. If you want to try the latest version or something, then that's one of the places to go. The equivalent to that uh, for SUSE is OpenSUSE. Um, we actually have a, a problem at the moment. Remember, this is July 2014. We're hoping to get this uh, fixed shortly. Uh, the installer uh, won't run on uh, Power 8, and all this is talking about Power 8 machines. Probably applies to Power um, 7 as well, actually. Uh, the, the new guy in town, I guess, is the Ubuntu. Um, IBM started working with with them, and they released um, Ubuntu 14.4 for Power. But note, this is a little Indian version of uh, Linux. Currently, um, it's only available on uh, machines that are in Power KVM. There are rumours that this will broaden out over time and may be available for Power VM that our AX machines are running on top of. But we'll have to wait and see. I can't really make announcements about that. And the next couple of slides, I'll just make a few comments about the various flavors of uh, Linux. Okay, we've got to start somewhere. So Susie's up first, 11.3, big ending as we'd expect. If you're running it on a Power 8 machine, it will actually be running the virtual machine in Power 7 compatibility mode. This is what it was tested against when it came out. Don't forget, IBM has some extra RPM packages to install. This uh, gives you some DIA commands, the RMC connection to the HMC, so that you can do dynamic uh, VM changes and things like live partition mobility. And from that same repository, there's the uh, Enmon uh, command. Uh, in my opinion, I like SUSE because it's probably easier for AX people to uh, live with, purely because it has this tool called YAST, yet another system tool, which feels like Smitty. You can go in there and get most things done. You don't have to worry about which files you have to change, what you type into them, and what services you have to restart to activate those changes. Here it is, uh, YAST, uh, running on a dumb console. And um, you can see sort of the graphics that are working. You move around uh, down in here. This is the uh, IP address. And you tab down to the edit key here um, and go into edit mode. And then you can change your IP address. And when you come out and OK this, it will restart the services and put you on the network. OK, and on to Red Hat. The 6.5 and 7. Uh, 7 is brand new. Uh, they're running Power 7 mode on a Power 8 uh, machine. Um, again, we've got the same or similar uh, RPM packages. They're different for the different level of the kernel. Um, for the, the diags, the connection to the HMC, live partition mobility and things. Um, faster to install, come to that in a second. The, um, in my opinion, because you have to go changing files to get things working, for example, to get it on the network, a little bit trickier for the AX admin guys to get started with it. So these are the list of files for Red Hat. Uh, Enterprise and the uh, Fedora version, you have to go and change these files. There's various uh, magic cookies you have to uh, put into them. And I find that uh, initially those will get broken uh, with every reboot, the resolve.conf particularly. Um, but I have in my expert blog an entry there that says these are the files and this is how to set them up with a worked example. Uh, don't use my IP addresses, <laughs> but uh, you should be able to follow that uh, fairly simply. Um, Red Hat actually installs very fast, but then it installs very little. Um, the other Linuxes install about 1,200 packages. Uh, Red Hat installs 200 packages. Um, but it means if you want anything else uh, running on your machine, um, like perhaps an FTP server or something, you really have to go and install or FTP server, then you have to set it up. 
uh, so it makes it a little bit uh, more complicated to work with but you do get a, a very small server uh, to start off and then you know what features and packages you've actually added and it says beware of the firewall by default the firewall stop anything working at all uh, which doesn't feel quite uh, as pleasant as AIX it goes the other way and lets everything work by default that has its own problems I can get the Fedora installer to actually set up the network of the basics onto the freely available internet download versions of uh, Linux for power Fedora 20 um, early software adopter for Red Hat the rumor has it that the Red Hat packages from IBM can install onto Fedora because the operating systems are, are pretty similar so that gives you the additional DIA commands and HMC connections. It also runs in Power 8 modes, that's quite nice. So we have SMT8, gives you a bit of a performance boost. There's a little bit of a bug in the installer, um, and uh, I've written this up in my expert blog. There's an entry there called Fun with Fedora that goes through, that does the little thing you have to do to get around the, uh, the bug. There's also the Debian. Uh, they have a massive internet repository for lots and lots of open source software. Very impressive installer to actually get it working. Works really nice. Shame the others can't follow that. Um, I do get fed up with people saying, well, they're not supported. Well, they are supported. You, know, you can buy it from third parties uh, via the internet. You actually get pretty good support because if you go looking on the internet, you probably find lots of other people have hit the, the snag or trying to fix the problem that you've got. And you can actually find uh, lots of suggestions out there. Of course, don't ask IBM for support because we just don't do that. A few little differences between uh, a PC and a power server. Um, if you've got a PC or a laptop, then 100% it's obvious to use the graphical user interface as that's a given and uh, effectively free. With your server, I recommend that you would start your installs with the console and probably use the VNC installer once you get to that part. And then when you're running, have X Windows via VNC available to you. This lets you see what the PC laptop guys are actually doing when you find hints and tips on how to install things how to set it up how to make changes then you can use the graphical user interface too if you're though running with tens hundreds or even thousands of virtual machines then you don't want lots of graphic screens um, or even virtual screens what you'll tend to do then is to automate network installs and you tend to only use the command line because that's a very quick and efficient way of making small changes to your machines you will have to make up your own mind of which Linux to use on your power machine. The IBM partnered ones, uh, Suzy and RHEL, they have uh, download trial versions from their websites. You may have to register to get hold of those. After the 60 days, of course, you are legally and morally obliged to uh, delete the virtual machines unless you pay up for the support and maintenance. The RPMs available from IBM allow you to connect to the HMC for reporting errors, dynamic elbow changes, live partition mobility, and the PowerVC that I've been using quite a lot recently has an activation engine for them. You'll have to design the, the distro in the version. Ubuntu is not currently available on PowerVM where you'll be running your AX images anyway. On the free side of uh, Linux, uh, you can download those from the internet of course. They tend to be more up to date with the uh, content and you will have to um, upgrade to the next version every six months or a year, depending on how fast they come out. They don't do uh, maintenance fixes. Uh, the OpenSUSE needs a fix at the moment. Debian 7.5 um, doesn't seem to want to install with uh, Multipath IO. That's what I found when I tried it. A lot of people just assume that we have Red Hat, we have CentOS, but they don't actually compile for the Power Platform um, anymore. So just as we finished, I hope I convinced you this is the smart way to run Linux on power. Use the technology we're familiar with to reduce the amount of work and learning you have to do with Linux. I create my uh, LPAS with two CPUs, virtual CPU or three, give it some little bit of headroom and eight gigabytes of memory. We use one virtual network, of course the VO server will do the automatic failover for us and we'll be using two virtual SCSI uh, connections to the VO servers to give us dual pathing and then we're going to have a shared storage pool behind the covers that will do the uh, mirroring for us and uh, some level of um, the duplication so we've got disaster recovery of our data and it will give us built-in live partition mobility. There is of course one thing left to do, we need to have some sort of installation media. We could use a, a physical DVD that's somewhat old-fashioned, there's only one or 
two devices like that in the machine usually and we don't really want to use Linux talking to a uh, fairly slow device. We could do network install, that tends to be the way to go eventually with uh, automatic installs and things. The virtual DVD where we add the ISO image to the virtual I.O. server and then mount this as a virtual device over the virtual SCSI into your Linux virtual machine, that's the one that makes sense to me. And that's uh, fairly easy to do, and we're probably already doing that with uh, AIX. So we're done for my Linux on Power for AIX people. Uh, the configuration side of things, I hope that will actually save you a lot of time, make life easier, use the technology you know to make life with Linux easier. In other parts of this series, we'll be looking at installing uh, various different flavors of Linux, and then we'll be looking at some killer apps. Some applications which are very easy to install and get going with Linux, will take you quite a lot of time if you try to run these on AIX.